All right. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Chris Paro. I've been working with DigitalOcean for about two years now. Uh, various things mostly related to keeping the lights on, keeping the events running, making sure you have a smooth experience as customers on this cloud. Um, so one of the fun things about this is I remember when we came on, we had somewhat limited visibility into what was going on. Like literally, we had a guy who watched this thing. <laughs> right, uh, awesome information, right? <laughs> um, you know, and then another page with a list of what was running and somebody would hit F5 and keep refreshing it. Uh, this worked okay when we were getting, you know, dozens of events an hour. Doesn't scale very well. <laughs> um, obviously, this starts scrolling so fast that you can't really tell what's going on and for that matter, doesn't tell you that much in the first place. So, as kind of a side project here, I did this thing called Perspective. Um, it's a visualization system for event streams. Um, could be applied to ours, could be applied to other things. We'll get a little bit into that later. Um, in practice, it's a bunch of glorified scatter plots. It does other things, but that's what we normally use it for. Um, and this is a visualization talk, so let's just hit some pictures. Um, so here is something that I'll have up during the day, like off on the side of my screen, usually tiled in with some code, terminal, chat window, and so on, where you can see what's going on in the system. Um, up top we have a dashboard that shows the last eight hours of activity on popular events. You can break it down by region if you want to go and see, well, what's going on in New York 3 or what's going on in Frankfurt. Um, down neath, We've got polar visualization, shows last 24 hours of activity. Uh, again, gives you a longer view, it's nice and compact. It's a little bit funnier to read, so a lot of people prefer the one up top. Um, if you want more detail, it'll feed this dashboard with information that feeds into this table here. Um, you're interested in any of those things, you can go click on its name that links off to more detailed information. You can see streaming logs and so on. Uh, that's outside of this system though. This just provides this listing. And you see something in there, you know, you see a little red dot in there that means a failure and you're like, whoa, what happened there? You can select that time region and it will come down highlighted and you can go again, pop into that level of detail. Uh, most often it'll be if you see a cluster of these things, you know, and this will tell you there's something amiss with the system and it hasn't triggered any of the automated alerts yet, but we should probably take a look at that. So this is really something that's a complement to, it's not a substitute for automated learning. It gives you a little bit more room for discernment. It obviously gives you a larger view. Um, at the same time, it only works if you're looking at it. So. This is something that you would run in conjunction with a paging system that has, you know, typical automated triggers. Uh, so here is an example of how you can look at it to see one kind of problem condition. So I don't know how well everyone can see this, hopefully okay, but do you see these gaps underneath the activity on these? All right, so this is an indication that something in the event processing pipeline has hung up. You know, it's hit a performance bottleneck, there's something that's gone non-responsive and things are sitting in the queue, you know, it's waiting to get dispatched and hasn't been picked up yet. Uh, we don't get many of these anymore. Uh, one of my coworkers, uh, Matt Layer, actually took care of most of that because most common reason for this was it was hanging up on uploading logs to a database, believe it or not. Um, but we would spot these things, we would correlate them to what was happening, we got rid of that problem, and in the short term it would tell us time to kick something. So, so there's this thing, there was a gap in mm -hmm. the back. Right. That? Sure. So on these, and the labels are external to the graphs, so when I show you just the graphs you don't have any. Um, but you have the time scale for when things were started going along horizontally. And then in a logarithmic scale going up, a time scale for how long things have been running or have run. Um, they'll be green if they're still running, but this is a view of the past, so obviously everything's done. So when you see that you've got 
an area where things are running and they're going up beyond the normal runtime and none of them are completing, then you have an indication that there's a hang in the system. You know, whereas we used to use metrics like how deep is the queue, how many events are in progress right now. Uh, and the problem with this is being a cloud, we'd have customers who would also like to issue a thousand events at once to just do some kind of like mass create or mass reboot or something like that, and that would trip those same alarms. So this way you can see this is something abnormal happening and not just a lot of activity going on. Is that? No? What's the benefit of using this UI compared to something like Red Byte? Good question, because that was actually uh, something that was asked of me before I even wrote this. <laughs> Uh, the big thing is that you can see correlations between things that you can't see in Graphite, you know, at least with the built-in graphs that you have there. I suppose if you plug something else into Whisper, you could have some fun with that. But you know, if you're showing a line graph here, you can show like average runtime, maximum runtime, event queue depth or count or something like that, you know, if you can put a stat on it. But you only have these linear plots. Uh, and if you're trying to correlate between these things, if you're trying to see, do we have slowdowns when there's a lot of activity, or you know, is this a shift in average because there are some long running outliers, or a shift in average because everything has shifted? You can't see that from those line plots unless you have a whole lot of them. And so. With the line graph? Sure, we'll, we'll get there actually. Because, um, I mean, yeah, so before this, and we actually, we do still have a graphite cluster running. It does still produce these line graphs. There are some things that they're just perfect for. Don't throw out a good tool. Um, but for these kinds of uses, what we'd end up with is like 12 graphs on a page, and you'd have to look at all of them to tie it together. And that wasn't very useful because it was no longer something that you could just see at a glance, hey, there's something happening. So this was fun. Um, this was a rather unpleasant week last year. Uh, we had a power outage in one of our regions and a whole bunch of the servers that provide images for creates were in RAID rebuild mode, which was causing requests to fail because they couldn't get to their images um, until we either restored them down or finished the rebuild. Um, <laughs> So aside from illustrating a few things in terms of changing business practices and where our focus was, this here shows how you can see things a little differently from just like, oh, I had a spike in error rate. Because there's a difference between this spike in error rate and this spike in error rate. You know, you don't see, are they fast failures? Is it everything failing at once or just some things failing? You know, here you get a sense of whether it's intermittent. Um, you can see if the failures are correlating on a particular start time or end time uh, a little bit more clearly than you could with something that's just spiking on, hey, a failure occurred. And here you actually have a few different things going on. So this little line here is a typical pattern for bad deploy. Uh, code went out, parameter was wrong, caught it right away, sent out a fix, problem solved. Um, these here, we had things that were going up against resources that we know we couldn't find, and so they failed right away. But we had users who were just spamming this, you know, trying to get it to work because they had scripts running that would retry until they finish. Very typical thing. It makes our life a little interesting sometimes, but totally get why people do this. Whereas these were the ones that had started into the process and had the transmission interrupted partway through. And so you can kind of see in this event, you had a few different kinds of failure modes. And if you just started picking things off like, oh, I grabbed 10 problems and went to see, well, what was the cause of that problem? Then you'd have some fun because depending on which 10 you picked, you might find them all in the same error case. You may have to get a distorted perception of what they are. A lot of times if you're basing this on logging or counters, you can only count the things that you've thought of counting before. So this is more impressionistic. It requires further investigation. Sorry, All right. I'm, I'm confused about what the y-axis means. All right, so, so, so the y-axis is runtime logarithmic scale, specifically log two. 
each bar up here, which with the contrast you can't really see, is one jump. Um, this band is the one minute point here. You know, this is your typical 55 second create. And so as you jump up a bar, you're doubling in time, doubling in time, and so on. Uh, it's logarithmic because if you did it linear, it would scale up past the ceiling. Uh, you have a very long tail on these things because, you know, most creates people do off of base images. They go fast. Sometimes somebody's downloading some 620 gigabyte behemoth, and that's going to take longer. And the color, so you have white, you have purple, and you have red. Are there the three colors there? All right, so the white here actually corresponds to just a very hot point of activity. It was to give us additional dynamic range. Um, the red is highlighted more. There's actually fewer steps before it hits full saturation because we want to make sure we see these. We want the errors to look worse than they are because we don't want to miss them. Um, whereas with the blue here, it blows out to white as a way of giving us twice as many steps to see how much activity is happening. And so, yeah, the darker blue it is, you know, or rather the brighter blue it is, and then going into white, you have increasing levels of activity at that point. Um, so another thing we tried out here was showing periodic behaviors. <laughs> so this one is creates mapped onto a 24 hour clock as it were for the last two years. Um, you can see here like what part of the day failures are most likely to happen in, uh, that we have a user who likes six times a day to do this huge batch of creates where your typical behaviors are, various other small spikes and so on in here. Uh, mostly this is useful as an exploration of questions like, is there any periodic behavior at this time scale? Is this something where is, as we get into more intelligence and scheduling events and so on, um, we can start trying to take advantage of regular behaviors to make sure data is queued up where it needs to be, resources are provisioned ahead of time, and so on. Um, so, kind of a curiosity at this point, but it does allow you to see very clearly that you do have these periodic behaviors. Now, this is the same thing, except it's only over the last quarter. Uh, Reliability is better, which is kind of nice, and you can see that the time range things have happened in has tightened down. Still get those six regular spikes and other ones. There's another user that once an hour is kicking things out. Um, but yeah, so it mostly just reveals that you have these regular patterns and on what periods they occur. Um, so this is cutting it up hourly. And so fun thing about this, there are also patterns every five minutes. And you know, it's really clear to see here, if you're showing it on the linear graph, you can sort of see these things, but there's so much noise in any particular small window of time from all the users that, you know, are just kicking stuff up when they need it, when they think of it, when they joined, <laughs> that you don't see these things the same way as you do when you wrap them back around and you map them onto that same space. You know, whereas if you're looking at something like this, imagine you map this onto a hypervisor and you say, here's how busy this hypervisor is over this range of time. And then you can map loads that are typical of a user's virtual machines and check correlations between the two. So it's another way of just kind of exploring opportunities to fit things together or to take anticipatory behaviors. Uh, again, same thing last quarter. You can see as we move more and more into people using it as a cloud relative to people using it as a VPS, you start getting a lot more of these regular behaviors. People are doing API-driven batch jobs, and they have schedulers that are just periodically rebalancing and rescaling their needs, and that's where you get these very regular spikes. Uh, all events. Yeah, at this point, it's just getting into stuff that looks cool. <laughs> um, you know, like you can see there are other patterns in here. If you break it down type for type, region for region, you can see more details about what exactly is causing that and, you know, pop into those logs to see, well, what user, what images, and so on. This is a starting point for exploration. It doesn't tell you everything, but it does give you an idea of what's worth looking into. Um, cut up by day, similar sort of pattern, and here's the week. 
And you can see you get those like seven rolling hills during business hours. It's a little quieter on the weekends, you know, something you'd probably see in every data center everywhere. Um, it's not as strong as I would have thought. Where's the weekend? Where's the weekend? It's over here. Um, so, so all of these things are basically centered with the top at the beginning of the Unix epoch. Uh, it, as far as the software tool is concerned, you can set that to any arbitrary point in time. Just for the sake of consistency, I picked January 1st, 1970. Um, so the thing that's interesting about this is that the periodic behaviors over the weekly cycle were less strong than I would have expected. Uh, we do get a lot of activity overnight. This one, as you move forward over time, actually starts evening out a lot more because we start rolling out data centers in other countries. We have more global users. And so that concept of business hours is not quite as centric on Eastern and Western time. <laughs> um, and if you don't wrap it around, you know, if you just say, all right, show me a year, over a year, you get this, you get this kind of ring form. This is similar to what you saw on that first dashboard. Um, mostly this is useful for wrapping around to see changes over time and where it meets up in the center, sort of like the histogram of before and after next to each other. You, know, you can see the events are a lot denser now than a year ago. You can also see that on average they're coming in quicker. Uh, this bit right here is what we were just showing you with that very unfun week with the power outage. Haven't really had anything like that since. We've done a lot of things to make sure that is not a problem. <laughs> um, and that helped to identify, you know, here's a point that requires attention. Uh, histograms, everybody does histograms, nothing really special here. Um, except it is a fun illustration of the first version on the left. We went with the quantization as it actually came in on the input data, and it was second granularity. Um, so you get this sort of artificial quantization of the input data, and it makes it look more regular than it is, and it distorts the levels. Uh, you add some noise to that, and you scale that to the quantization error at any given point, because logarithmic scale, the quantization error spatially will decrease as the time increases and you get something that's a much more perceptually accurate picture. So it's just kind of a fun illustration of sometimes by messing up the data a bit, you produce something that's more accurate in how you're gonna perceive it to the reality. Line graphs, this one's for event counts. Again, going over that same time period. Uh, fun point here. Um, this one still just creates, pick creates because it's our most eventful thing. It's got the most variation. It's got the most opportunities for failure. So it's interesting to look at. Um, general linear trend, but you can see the variations. You can see hints of those cycles in there and where you do have outliers. And runtime line graph. So again, you know, this thing, Graphite does this just fine, which is part of why this is in there, it's not used much. Um, if you're looking at this and you see you know, a spike up in this, do you know if it's because you've got a clump of outliers that are way outside the normal range or because everything slowed down at that time? And you, know, you can apply filters, you can say, well, show me the middle 90%, you, know, you can compare it against a mean, compare it against a minimum, but you're getting into multiple graphs or you're making predeterminations about which data to throw out. Whereas in that sort of two-dimensional mapping, you can just look at it and make those decisions in the moment. So it doesn't tell you things really, it just digests the data into a way that's easier for you to make those decisions about what is it that I'm looking at and which parts of this am I, are important to me. Um, so here we got some stuff that we played with and threw out because it looks cool and again, nobody uses it. Um, so we had this arc graph, again showing that lovely little horror story period, just the worst part of it, um, that shows like event for event its entire lifetime tracing through time. Down below, one that shows a stack of error causes, you know, the idea being you can mouse over it and see, oh, this was this kind of error and this was that kind of error. Um, 
by the time this was done, this wasn't relevant anymore because error rates were at a point low enough now that you would just say, well, what was a problem this month? You know, take care of that because you know, we're now in that sort of three to four nines territory. You don't get enough for this to mean anything. Um, and this tells you the same things as the scatter plot, but it's a higher cognitive load to look at it. It's more to show. And so it's cut back out of the program. Um, same sort of thing here with things to show Q depth similarly discarded. And uh, part of the point of this exercise is to say, chances are whenever you're writing software and you're trying to do anything novel, you're gonna do stuff that's not terribly useful and you won't know that until you've done it. Um, so here we banged out this program, threw it at the wall and some parts of it stuck. Some parts of it are actually up on our walls. And other parts, you know, kind of sat here, and rather than maintaining them into perpetuity, we just toss them out, because not using it, don't keep it. So <laughs> back around on all this, that was kind of entertaining. But um, so yeah, like what it was meant to solve, uh, part of it was, and this is in its name, um, if you have a system that's growing rapidly, and this cloud has grown some orders of magnitude since I came in here, um, it feels like you have a lot more problems. You know, it, like it's, if you have the same relative rate of errors and failures, you know, server crashes or just an event doesn't go or whatever, somebody opens a ticket, but you have a cloud that's 10 times as big as it was some months ago, and then 10 times after that, it's gonna feel like you have a lot more coming in. And so there was a general perception of things being much worse than they were. <laughs> it got kind of doom and gloom here. And so this was a way of highlighting, no, actually, if you look in relative terms, things have, generally speaking, stabilized. Just activities increased a lot. Now that said, there are still problems. Any non-trivial system's gonna have them. So it was a good way of highlighting where there were problems. Um, and that they weren't really what common perception was. You know, common perception is like, well, you got bugs in the program, the code looks ugly in places, so that must be what's causing trouble. And if you look at the reality, reality of it, most of the problems were things where we didn't act on some single point of failure out in the infrastructure, like with the NASs and the power outage. Um, so rather than being scared of a regression and taking care of that, just take care of it. Um, Conversely, a lot of the other problems were shooting ourselves in the foot. Testing is important, you know, getting things through staging environments, being more careful in reviews. And a lot of those were issues where it would be a problem for two minutes, five minutes, and it'd get caught and fixed. But that's still something that, you know, for someone out there produced an unreliable experience. And so working towards eliminating that takes care of a lot of our problems. Um, and then finally, there was the class of issue of things that just escape notice for a while. You know, you'd have a bad server that things keep getting scheduled to, and that isn't noticed because nobody's put in an automated check for it yet, or you've got a particular image that causes problems or something. You know, things that you would do a code fix for, or possibly even just a manual fix because it's just something in the infrastructure that's not behaving. Um, which if you're not taking a long view of things will get lost because it'll be two or three problems and then some time and then two or three more. But if you're looking at this, you can just kind of see there's a correlation there. And it's really depending on humans being really good at pattern detection. A lot of times if you look at it at first, it's like, uh, it's a bunch of dots. And if you look at it for a few days, you start seeing a lot more about what's going on just because it's familiar and you get a sense for what's normal. Um, so if you think of it as like, you know, like when you take your car into the mechanics or something like that, you know, what do you say? It's, it's making a sound. Where does the sound come from? What does it sound like? You know, there, there's feedback mechanisms and how it vibrates and sounds and looks. And clouds, computers, software, they don't provide these kinds of direct feedback that physical machines do. So producing things that can provide that give us an avenue outside of, you know, trying to get into machine learning techniques or getting into expert systems and, you know, these like hard-coded triggers and thresholds, recognize when things aren't behaving quite when they're supposed to, and oftentimes catch problems before they escalate to a point that they would trigger something that's, you know, a definite alert on a problem. 
Um, and then it was also kind of fun as a thing to show history. You know, like, small companies, startups, you tend to have some turnover, and even if you don't, you're just growing quickly. So you're gonna have a lot of new people. Um, Postmortems, they're dry, they take a long time to read. You know, a lot of times they're read once by the people who wrote them, and they kind of sit there and you look at it again, maybe if you see something familiar. Um, but it's not very realistic to ask anybody when they come into a company to read every postmortem that's happened. <laughs> um, at the same time, you know, you can have these like sort of war stories about the old times. You lose detail. It gets impressionistic. You know, it's hard to tell scale, frequency, and so on. Whereas here, you have something that's driven by the actual data, but you can point to this and you can provide those, you know, points of scale and just a way of picturing out, like, what, what's going on? What does it look like to the operators here? What does it look like to a customer out there? Um, you know, to complement those words and give them some scale and detail. Uh, actually considered calling it tapestry for a bit and decided that was silly. So evolution of this thing is totally a worse is better philosophy. Um, you know, I, I knew this was something that was going to be a side project and some free time and I really wanted to get usable functionality quickly. So it began as this nasty little command line utility, everything in one main method, parsing CSV input dumped from a database um, to generate a picture. And you, you could point at this and I would make one at the end of the day. Here's what happened today. Uh, it's not the most live of information though. It's not the best paradigm for usage or integration into anything though. So I reworked it into an HTTP service. Um, gave it some mechanisms so you could attach these dashboards. And the dashboards are just some JavaScript that generates a list of charts, wraps them in the labels, gives them the click actions, and so on. Um, but you know, now you've got something that's a live feed. You don't have to keep hitting F5 on this, but you have something that changes slowly enough and subtly enough that you, know, you can run it off in the corner of your screen. It's not constantly stealing your attention. Um, you just you glance at it every once in a while, same as your email inbox or your chat window to see, hey, is there something new that's coming up? Um, so for this, it had to have some performance tuning. Um, when you're looking at these long views, it's dealing with millions of data points to graph, and I don't like things that you have to wait for in a get up and go do something else kind of sense. And starting off using go the right way, as it were, you know, with the binary readers and the clean, safe ways of doing things, it was slow. <laughs> um, you know, similarly, if you're doing the live polling dashboards and so on, you want something light, something that can serve a bunch of clients and not fall over. You don't want to have to scale an app like this across a bunch of servers. You could if you wanted to, but that costs money, so don't if you don't have to. Um, so, you know, do some zero copy, memory map the feeds and so on, get into those unsafe packages and try to constrain it in as well documented and sane a way as possible. And you can get really good performance out of a Go program, um, similar to what you could expect out of C or Java if you're doing those with you know, the similar paradigms. Um, important point there, the performance tuning came after getting it to be usable. <laughs> uh, optimization is good. It's the premature optimization that's bad. You know, you find a pain point, you get it good enough, and then you leave it be until it's not again. Um, but as we started trying to build new functionality onto this, brittle points did emerge. Um, so it did have a fixed data schema that was effectively hard coded in. Um, the way it's loaded, you feed it a whole dump at once or an HTTP post, so there's not really a good way of just adding a little bit of data or updating a few points in there. Um, the uh, mechanism where it depends on the external dashboard to provide the context and the labeling and so on is such that um, that's great if you know how this works and you want to write a dashboard, but it doesn't come with the program. You know, there's no way of just saying dashboard me, you have to make one and put it in its content folder and then it will serve it to you. Um, and so all of those points looked at together, it lead to the thought that 
this is a prototype, you know, it's, it's the second prototype that nasty little CSV parsing script was the first. Um, and now is the time to look at doing this right. You know, having the data stream through on a completely push basis, have a process in line, having a lot of this rendering moved out to the client side. It turns out JavaScript's grown up in the last decade since I looked at it before, and I, I've been impressed. This would allow for a lot nicer interactivity. You know, you could do things like pick off one of those points, you know, forget looking for it in the table beneath, you know, let me go to the logs from that, you know, like show hover information, um, integrate in the dashboard generation, the labeling and so forth. Um, and also there's really no reason why I should have to, if I'm doing one of these live dashboards, because this has turned out to be the primary use case, not the secondary. You know, it's, it's original goals of like historical perspective and live feed. Um, they both turned out to be uses, but the degree to which one was the primary and secondary is backwards from original expectation. So something that just sends you what's new and then on the client it you know, rolls over the image and appends that part or updates the relevant points is actually gonna be a lot lighter on bandwidth, lighter on the server. So the things that can be done there to improve the performance practically and just keep it in that real instantaneous kind of experience for the user. Because you know, part of the point of this is seamless experience. You should just feel like you're getting direct feedback. Um, finally, and this is just something that, right. the, the yearly graphs, um, so this actually depends a little bit on which year, but over the last year, this is the busiest year, um, it's like two seconds. Get about 100,000 per day, so three and a half million-ish. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's not awful. It, it could be better, you know. At that point, like for that graph, could be better basically means you write it in C and you don't use Go's PNG encoder because it's spending about as much time encoding the PNG as it is rendering the data points. Um, more relevant actually in terms of where it has a performance shortcoming is for loading things into the dashboard because, you know, for each of those, it is taking, you know, about 50 to 200 milliseconds depending on how much data is going into the graph and the fun thing. More data in the graph means it takes longer for the PNG encoding too because of how that works. So it scales on both points. Um, but, you know, like that's fine if you're talking about an individual thing. Even if you do the button click, you've got something that's perceptually close to instantaneous. But if I want to have this as something that you can show on 200 desktops off of one machine, now you're starting to fill up your time. Whereas if you've got something that just sends out those last data points, you can just keep scaling this and scaling this. Uh, also more importantly, these are relatively low data rate events because here we're talking about system management tasks. We're talking about the control plane of the cloud. If we want to start visualizing the data plane of the cloud, you know, somebody opened up a connection, there's some packets being sent through, you know, monitoring utilization aspects and so on. You're talking about a much bigger pipe of data. So even without filling a lot of seats, you are talking about conveying a lot more and probably wanting to have it at a higher update frequency than, you know, your five or 10 second interval. Um, but it's mostly the flexibility points where the architecture has hit walls. And, you know, that, that's typical with something that you did in a get it to work and then worry about cleaning it up aspect. You solve that problem. You don't necessarily have something that solves other problems particularly well. So if you're feeding it something that's similar quantities of data for a similar kind of display, it'll do that just fine. It doesn't really care that they're digital ocean cloud events. Um, but if we want to do something that's got a larger number of different statuses or, you know, layering things, inserting a new visualization requires changing code in a bunch of places, it has some maintenance pain points. Um, and so, trying not to run too badly over on time here because we've got some other cool things to look at. <laughs> um, you know, the big lesson learned here is if you've Got an idea for something to do, just, just do it. Because um, you're gonna get a bunch of questions. Why do we need that and isn't that just like something else? Um, 
And they're both valid questions, and sometimes the answer is we don't, and sometimes the answer is it is, but that's not always clear until you've done at least some prototyping work, so just go ahead and do it. Uh, and then the other point is get it done. Because if I or anyone had really started into this process trying to architect the ultimate data collection and visualization pipeline, I, there'd be nothing to show right now. I would have run out of time and probably run out of interest on this project, just getting back on the day-to-day -day issues. And instead of having a useful tool and a bunch of feedback from users to inform a newer, better version, I'd just have some half-finished specs somewhere. So, you know, you're talking about a business, you want your minimum viable product, you want to just get out there and get feedback as quickly as possible, do the same thing with software, especially if it's not something that can break other things. It's a dashboard. <laughs> the worst thing it can do is not show you something. Um, and that will get you much better information for moving forward with the product. Um, so yeah, if after Thor talks, anyone wants to grab me and talk, I am going to be here. Otherwise, if anyone wants to email me, just cparo, C-P-A-R-O, at digitalocean.com. Um, if you're interested in contributing to this or if you're interested in being a customer, you know, like I don't really know how to approach coding this, but I want it. I want your feedback. <laughs> you know, I want customers to inform the design of the product going forward because right now it was built to solve one company's problems and it could really probably solve a lot of people's. Uh, perspective? Yes, yes it is. It, it's actually out on GitHub under github.com, Ciparo perspective, easy enough to find. Um, probably the follow one is gonna go under the DigitalOcean repo because we're getting an actual open source <laughs> procedure together. Um, but yeah, this is all open source work. Any other questions, comments? <laughs> All right.